I came to the topic I want to talk about today after doing extensive research on the Equal Rights Amendment as part of my doctoral dissertation and the subject of a book that I'm working on. And the Federal Equal Rights Amendment, when people think about it and they think about the South, what they usually recall, if they recall anything, is that Southern states did not support the Federal Equal Rights Amendment. They were not likely to ratify the Federal ERA. And so if it's remembered, if anybody thinks about the South and the ERA, they think of it perhaps as part of why uh, the ERA did not succeed, why we did not end up with it in our Constitution. What people don't remember usually is that there were three Southern states that did ratify the Federal Equal Rights Amendment, and those would be Tennessee, Kentucky, and Texas. And I am sure you'll be very surprised to hear that Texas was special. <laughs> You've never heard that before, right? <laughs> Texas was special because it was the only Southern state that ratified the Federal Equal Rights Amendment and then did not attempt to undo that by rescinding that ratification later. So Kentucky and Tennessee both basically renounced their ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Texas did not. Oh, good. There we go. Okay, so um, I became really curious. How on earth did Texas inhabit this strange status of being the only southern state to ratify the ERA and stand by that ratification? And when I tried to find the answer to that, it led directly to feminist activism occurring in a period in which most people would have thought there was no such thing. This period that you could refer to as between the waves between the first wave of trying to obtain the votes, votes for women and the second wave, which people tend to think of as sort of the 1970s into the 80s, when the ERA was really the focal point for organized feminism. That period between the waves turns out to be essential for understanding why Texas was unique in its support of the federal ERA. And so to talk about that a little bit more, I'm gonna tell you about three women and what part they played in making Texas fairly unique in the South for its support of the ERA, the federal ERA. So you'll see I have um, three women that I'll be talking about, Judge Sarah Hughes, Louise Ballerstedt Raggio, and Hermine Dalkowitz Tobolowski. And these three fit in with the themes that my co-panelists have been talking about, um, this idea that feminist activists or women's rights activists could span the century through networking, mentoring those who were younger, helping each other, transmitting uh, strategies or information, and bridging that gap between the waves. So I'm going to tell you about each of them in turn. First, I want to talk about Sarah Hughes. Yes, I know, this is one of those nightmare PowerPoints with too much text. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to tell you all about it, but it's there as a reference. So Judge Sarah Hughes, as you can see, just from glancing at this slide, she did a lot of things. She really mm -hmm. earned her nickname, the Dallas Dynamo, okay? And Sarah Hughes, she gets her start um, as a, from a, a fairly well-to-do family. Her family was comfortably middle class. It had an illustrious history. Her family was one of the oldest families in the state of Maryland. She had a famous forebear who had been an aide-de-camp to George Washington and appears in paintings of the American Revolution. She has this illustrious family history, all right? And she earned her place in a women's college, a scholarship. She got that through hard work. Her mother had always told her, you can be anything you want to be always, and you should always try to be number one. And so she had this very supportive mother who really ran counter to um, typical gender norms of the day, which would have said, well, you shouldn't be anything you want to be if you're female. No, her mother said, you can do whatever you want. She ends up, after college, becoming a policewoman. She was very petite, very slight, and here she was working as a policewoman in Washington, D.C., and they put her on this... Uh, task of finding runaways, lost children, or young women, trying to find them and rescue them before they had fallen into, you know, come to a bad end or fallen into disrepute. So that was her beat as a policewoman. 
She was actually there at the White House trying to keep order when suffragists were doing things like picketing the White House and people were physically attacking the suffragists. So she remembered the suffrage movement, but as a law enforcement official trying to keep the crowd from panicking and, and rioting. She did this stint as a policewoman specifically to pay for graduate school. She paid for a law degree that she did at night at the George Washington University. She also met her husband there, one of her classmates in law school. And they married. He was deeply attached to Texas, and she was up for an adventure. So they moved to Texas, and within simply about seven years of being here, she had decided she was going to run for office. Most people would have told her if she'd asked that seven years was not going to be a long enough time to have established an identity as a Texan for people to vote for you. She didn't care. She wasn't interested. You couldn't tell her no. She got involved in the Democratic Party. She was a very faithful, loyal party member and party worker. She campaigned for lots and lots of people to help get them elected. When she decides to run for office, she has a whole network, predominantly male, of politicians and political party insiders who are ready to help her. She ends up being elected for three different terms in a row to the uh, State House of Representatives. She loves politics. She loved politics in the way that an athlete loves the game he or she specializes in. She saw politics as a game. She saw it as a fight. She loved the fight. And what she couldn't stand was anybody who wasn't willing to get into the arena and really, you know, engage with their competitors in whatever it took in order to win. She wasn't phased by being attacked or criticized. Um, at one point, when she wanted to become a district court judge, one of her political opponents said, unfortunately for him, he said this out loud in front of a reporter, she should be home washing dishes. That was it. The women of Texas were furious. They mobilized. They flooded the appropriate people with letters. And she was appointed to this district court position as a judge. So she actually thought that her political opponent being sexist was the best thing that could have happened. It worked for her. <laughs> She later decides she wants to be a federal district court judge. There had never been a female federal district court judge in Texas. She didn't care, she wanted it. So she called in every political favor she had. She came right out and said to the right people, I want this, appoint me, make this happen. She wasn't shy about it, she wasn't being modest. She wanted it, she went for it. She worked the political system, she worked that whole patronage network she worked the uh, connections that she had in the Texas and National Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs. So she becomes the first female federal district court judge in Texas, and I think it was, she was the second one in the country. This is where most people's knowledge of her stops because she's most famous for her connection to Lyndon Johnson. In 1963, when... Um, President Kennedy was here in Dallas and was assassinated, and there was an emergency situation. Somebody had to swear in our vice president as our new president. She was the one he asked for. He wanted her. And she knew, she was very pragmatic. She knew this wasn't because she was so great. She knew it was because he couldn't stand one of the other federal judges. <laughs> and I think he was not on speaking terms with the third one. So she was it. But she was happy to oblige, and that's what most people know her for. They know her famously as the one who swore in Lyndon Johnson on Air Force One. But if you look more closely at what she was up to through this long, illustrious history, she was a power behind that push to get women the right to serve on juries. And when critics would say things like, why should women want to be serving on juries? It's not fun. She would say, nobody wants to serve on juries. That's not the point. The point is to have justice be served. You want to make sure that if a woman is on trial, she's got a jury of her peers. You want to know that if a man is on trial, his jury of peers includes women. That's how justice works. It's not about loving doing jury duty. It's about making sure you're doing what's right and what serves justice. Now, she... Uh, is also not known for this, but should be. 
she mentored, among other people, Louise Ballerstedt Raggio. I'll tell you a little bit about her in a moment. She also was the, one of the three judges on the Roe versus Wade decision in 1970 in Texas, which declared that abortion should be legal, that preventing women from access to abortions was unconstitutional. Her decision was upheld by the Supreme Court in 1973. Sarah Weddington, the young lawyer from Texas who argued the case Roe versus Wade in front of Sarah Hughes, remembered that she was scared to death. She'd never argued a case in court before. She was shaking like a leaf. She wasn't sure she could do it. And she looked up at Judge Hughes, and Judge Hughes gave her a little wink. Not because she was promising anything, but more like, I've been there. I know what it's like. You can do this. Go for it. And so even in this kind of informal way, mentoring a young person coming on up through the ranks the way that she had. 